Okay, it's uh, it's April 9th, uh, 2015. I'm here with uh, uh, Jim Schnur, S-C-H-N-U-R, graduate of USF Tampa, class of 1988 history undergrad, 95 masters in history, 96 masters in library science. Native of St. Petersburg, Florida, president of the Pinellas County Historical Society, and currently president and currently special collections librarian at the rank of university librarian on the USF St. Petersburg campus. Sweet. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk about John's committee a little okay. bit today. Um, you know, and, and in many ways, uh, you know, I mean, I think scholars in the know know that you kind of cracked that shell uh, of doing research on the John's committee because there was so little official stuff, you know, that was available before, uh, before you kind of, uh, you know, brought it to, to light. So tell us about a little bit about just, first of all, how did you become aware of the John's committee? How did you get interested? And then how did you kind of crack that shell? Okay. Well, I was, I became interested in the John's committee in 1989, 1990. One of the things I did as an undergraduate, I took a independent study, an independent study with Gary Mormino, who was a professor over here. And I also took a biography sem seminar with Jim Swanson, who taught history for a long time over here. Jim Swanson was one of the early faculty members. In Jim Swanson's pro seminar back in 88, I had to do, it was a pro seminar on biography, and I chose to do Leroy Collins. And so from that, I put together a lot of stuff about Leroy Collins, a lot of research. Much of my work actually came in Tampa Campus Library Special Collections, which has the Leroy Collins papers, a very distinctive collection. After that, I became interested in post-war Florida history. Gary Mormino and I did a little bit more work in that area. Uh, by 1989, 1990, I was starting graduate school, had just finished my undergrad, and I was interested in looking at Florida politics, Florida history. I took a course with Ray Arsenal over at USF St. Pete, and the focus was U.S. 1960 to 1980. And while doing the research, one of the books that I had to read was Ellen Trecker's book, No Ivory Tower, which is about McCarthyism in the universities. What was very important to me, what I got out of that book, was the fact that Universities throughout the United States, in different parts of the country, experienced different types of attacks in the years right after World War II, largely anti-communism, sometimes civil rights entered the picture. In doing my research, I found that in the early 1960s, something happened at the University of South Florida, school I attend, and USF was a very young institution at that time. It had been censured by the American Association of University Professors, and I was wondering why. As I started to dig deeper, I kept hearing about the Johns, as many people call it, the Johns Commission or the Johns Committee. And then I knew a little bit about Charlie Johns from my work with Leroy Collins. So I started to dig deeper and deeper, and before you knew it, I had about a 50-page paper for the class. And what I did is it was a, a paper called Academic Freedom and Intellectual Inquiry in Florida's Universities. And I looked at the Johns Committee. Very sketchy. I looked at it within the context of the Cold War. It looked at the witch hunts as being anti-communist and anti-integration activities. So I was interested. About that same time, I was taking another seminar at the graduate level with Steve Lawson, who was a longtime professor over at USF Tampa, who actually started over at USF St. Pete. And Dr. Lawson um, was teaching the Civil Rights Seminar. And for part of my research for him, I also became interested in Cold War activities. So working on some research with Drs. Lawson, Mormino, and Arsenal, I became very interested in getting more into the Johns Committee. That's quite the trifecta there, too. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I had the benefit. When I was at the graduate school at USF, uh, the history department in the late 80s, early 90s was just full of phenomenal faculty. You had Steve Lawson, you had Nancy Hewitt, you had Lou Perez, you had Ray Arsenal, Gary Mormino. You had just a great core folk. And it was a wonderful time to be here at this institution. What was interesting about Steve, though, was that he had worked on trying to get those records of the Johns Committee open. The committee started in 1965, during the summer of 65, late spring, as a reaction to the Tallahassee bus boycott. In Tallahassee... You mean 55? 1956. 56, yeah, okay. 56, yeah. yeah. In 1956, there was a bus boycott in Tallahassee. And as a result of that, the Johns Committee was started. It was started as a way to curtail what they felt was a communist-infiltrated uprising in Tallahassee. They looked at um, the students at Florida A&M and at FSU, a handful of white students at FSU, had looked at what Rosa Parks had done earlier in Montgomery, and they became inspired by her. And as I've often said, the Tallahassee bus board caught of the spring and summer of 1956 was one of the first, quote, student protest movements of the 1960s. It was very student, much student-inspired and led. 
The Johns Committee started in 1956, continued until 1965. What happened was that the records were closed after that, um, and we'll, I'll talk more about that later. But what's amazing is I talked with Dr. Lawson, and he talked about how he, in the early 1980s, had tried to get the records opened. Um, and he talked about a former graduate student of his, Bonnie Stark. Bonnie Stark had worked in the 1980s and did her master's thesis where she had talked about the Johns Committee. That was the focus of her work. Bonnie did an amazing job. Bonnie was doing her work primarily off of newspaper articles and clippings. She lived in special collections. She worked in the Tampa Campus Library archives in terms of uh, just spending hours and hours as a graduate student living here and making it all happen. Spent a lot of time in the microfilm room. Bonnie's work was pretty thorough, and so I wanted to take it to the next step. By that point, it was the early 1990s, I put a number of letters together. I tried to write a letter to the Senate Council President, to the President of the Senate, who was Gwen Margolis, I believe. This is um, a time when Florida was going through some transitions, and at this point, Charlie Johnson passed away. And I made a request under Florida's public records law. Florida has a very liberal and open public records law and it allows for access to documents we call it government in the sunshine. So I made a chapter 119 request under Florida Public Records Law and immediately I received a letter back from D. Stephen Kahn who was the Senate Counsel. He was the attorney for the Senate of Florida. What Kahn said was that the records of the Johns Committee or as it was officially known the Florida Legislative Investigation Committee were to be closed until the end of I think December 2028 he made the argument that these were in accordance with census records. If you look at census forms, there's a 72 year period between when you fill out a form and when the individual records are open. That's why in 2015 we have the 1940 census, but we don't have the 1950 individual census yet. So he was making the argument that these were like census records. They'd have to be closed for 72 years. Well, of course, the reason is because what the committee was doing was so criminal that it needed to be closed because they were trying to protect the legacies of all the people who have been on the committee. The winds had changed a lot between the 1990s and the 1950s and 60s when the committee was in its heyday. So I made a number of letters, I wrote a number of letters to try to force the issue. Um, I wrote to Charlie Reed, who was the chair, or the director of the Board of Trustees, I'm sorry, the Board of Regents. Right. Charlie Reed was the Chancellor of the Board of Regents at that time. President Frank Borkowski, I wrote letters all up and down the chain to let them know what I wanted to do. And I received letters of support from President Borkowski and others saying, go for it, you need you know, to pursue this. Unfortunately, what happened was every time I pursued it, it really fell on deaf ears. A lot of credit goes to the local community. There was a longtime editor of editorials at the St. Petersburg Times, today the Tampa Bay Times, named Bob Pittman. Robert Pittman was a progressive editorial writer who sometimes pushed the edges of things. He also worked very closely with Leroy Collins on a number of articles that Collins had written for the Times. Bob Pittman wrote a really nice editorial in August of 1991, I believe it was, where he said, here's this graduate student at USF named Jim Schnur. He wants to get into these records of this committee that did some bad things a long time ago. What's the problem? And some of that helped a little bit. And other writers, there was a article that took place in the Miami Herald's Tropic Magazine, I think it was, um, by a writer named McGarrahan, I, I believe. There were a number of other writers, had a number of folks who are very involved in the Tampa Bay area who are noted at the USF Tampa campus from that time. Leland Halls, a longtime writer from the Tampa Tribune, who was uh, a very big friend of USF Tampa Library, he also was very supportive. So I had a lot of good support, and they wrote articles and wrote letters of support along the way. Nothing really happened. So I kept looking at the newspaper articles and I started to do the research. My committee was Ray Arsenault, Gary Mormino, and John Bell Lobby. So I had a really good committee of rock stars. So the class that, that kicked all this off was long past. Yeah. And, and you're thinking about your thesis now. Right. So we're now talking 1991, 1992. Right. So we're a couple of years in. It's a couple of years after my class. I was working my way through graduate school. I was working as a student assistant at USFSP. I was working all over the place. And I really was trying to get this history masters moving forward. And so along the way, I kept trying to nudge the issue about getting the records open. A lot of others got involved. So this wasn't a one-person effort. This was actually a multi-party effort. And the biggest thing that helped wasn't me or any other individual as much as a court case. Mm -hmm. Court case that invalidated parts of Florida's public records law. So what happened was that they had to reestablish parts of the public records law. And again, I don't remember all the details at the time, but 
one of the things that began to uh, become an issue that was raised was now that we're rewriting the public records law, and now the time has passed with the Johns Committee, is there any possibility of us moving this to open those records? Fortunately, the legislature allowed for an exemption under Chapter 119 um, to, to open the records of what they called criminal investigations, but as long as the names of those who were victimized were redacted. So this happened in an early 2000, I'm sorry, in early 1993, sometime around March or April, I think, right in the early part of 1993, the records of the Johns Committee were slated to be opened as of July 1. Over 25,000 documents. Um, the irony is that for many years, and the exact story of where they were located varies. Alan Morse, who was a longtime historian of the Florida legislature, claimed that for years the records were moved from the Capitol building, the old Capitol, over to the state archives. But at some point they came back over, well, probably after the new Capitol was built in the 1970s, um, and were put into a closet, which I find ironic, that they locked the records in a closet because of some of the contents therein. From what I heard, and again, a lot of this is hearsay and not really easy to verify or impossible to verify, all the good stuff in terms of photographs and the, 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 the stuff that was the most revealing was destroyed a long time ago. Although they did have some interesting things. I did hear that they had garbage bags full of stuff, but exactly what it is is up for conjecture. Long story short, in early 1993, the state of Florida was tasked with getting these 25,000 or so pages ready for public access. Um, the records were to be available on July 1. So they had a big problem on their hands because they didn't have the staff to do this. So what they did was they did something that no archivist would ever tolerate except this is Florida and as they said in the 1980s, that old commercial, the rules are different here. So what they did is they gave the um, records to a bunch of students, I think primarily FSU students, who were OPS, they were temporary employees, student assistants, a work study probably. They gave them Sharpie markers and they mutilated the original documents. They told students, you see a name, black it out. Now a good archivist would, if, if, a re, if the law requires that a document be redacted, what you do is you take the original with the content, which is kept secure and never shared with the public unless it's allowed to in the future. You make a copy of it you black out the copy, then you make another copy so that there's no way it can be read through. That's what you should do to protect the records and to protect the people who were supposedly protected under the legislature. What the state of Florida did in early 1993, in a sense, was mutilate the entire collection of records. They destroyed the records. What things did the students block out? They blacked out the letterhead that had the name of the governor. So Governor Blank was governor in 1962, when everybody can know that it was Ferris Bryant. Um, they, it was done really haphazardly. Through no fault of the students, they were just given markers and told to mark names out. And they missed quite a few names along the way in their haste. And so what happened is in the early part of the spring of 1993, the records are getting ready. I, at that time, was also getting ready to go up to uh, Tallahassee for July 1st. Don't remember the exact time, but it was about the same time that all this was going on. I worked as a student assistant at USF St. Pete, and at that point, the highest, uh, the highest honor that the president of USF could confer upon a non-USF graduate was the President's Medallion of President's Seal, I think it was called, President's Award. Anyways, President Borkowski at that time, I believe, he was still president, was going to give that to Bill Young, who was a longtime St. Petersburg representative. At that time, very involved as a longtime member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Very powerful with bringing home the pork to Pinellas County in terms of legislative allocations from U.S. Congress. But also in the early 1960s, an ambitious state senator from Pinellas County who was a member of the Johns Committee. So I had the pleasure of getting over to the Tampa campus, and I, this was right about the time that somebody had interviewed me, I think it was from WUSF Radio, about the Johns Committee. Um, this was the day of commencement, and I believe it was for the Florida Report, which was an old afternoon program that WUSF Radio used to do as part of the NPR. It was a local segment that tied in with NPR around the time of All Things Considered. So on the day that I was to be back at the St. Pete campus that evening to videotape the graduation where Bill Young gets this honor, earlier that afternoon, I was here on the Tampa campus in the studios of WUSF Radio being interviewed about the Johns Committee and about 
the activities thereof, and especially about how the person who was getting the award from the then president of the university was very much involved with hurting the university in its infancy. So as I'm driving back from Tampa to St. Petersburg and hitting Malfunction Junction at about 435 or so, I have the radio on. I'm listening to myself on WUSF. You know, as they as they had the over, you know, the introduction, you know, USF St. Petersburg or the USF St. Pete campus is awarding Bill Young the presidential seal from President Borkowski, Jim Schneer, a graduate student at USF, um, who has done some research on the Johns Committee, knows a little bit about another part of Bill Young's life. And there I am listening to myself as I'm trying to get over to the Mahaffey Theater to go and videotape the event. You know, it's not probably the wisest thing for a person to do. So they linked the two stories together. They linked the two stories wow. together. I mean, WUSF Radio rocks. And, <laughs> and, you know, it's great because the, the timing was, was awesome. And WUSF Radio is going to come back into the story a little bit later. I have also was interviewed a few times by WMNF, by a talk radio station in Orlando about this time. The exact years, I don't remember, but a lot between 91 and 93, I was interviewed a number of times as a you know, as the innocent, which I really was, the innocent graduate student who just wanted access to these records. Now, I wasn't the only person trying to work on this topic, but at that point, I was the person who was trying to move things forward to get my thesis done. I wanted to graduate, to be honest with you. Right. But I also wanted the story to be righteous. So, as 19, so what happens in late June of 19, I'm sorry, late June of 1993, I move up to Tallahassee. I get a dorm room up in Rogers Hall, which is a graduate dorm at FSU for that summer and the following summer. I get there just a couple days before the records open. So I'm sitting in Strozier Library at FSU looking through microfilms. July 1 rolls in, I get to the Senate Office Building, which is one of the two buildings alongside the Capitol in Tallahassee as part of the Capitol Complex. And I always referred to it during my time up there by its acronym, the SOB. So I would go, so I went into the SOB on July 1 of 1993, and the place was a madhouse. They had the boxes, and I grabbed box number nine, which was the box of lists. The other boxes were being hoarded by about 30 or 40 reporters, either online, uh, well, basically television or radio or newspaper reporters, who were looking for names. Names that they could scour so they could knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I hear you lost your teaching license in 1963. What's that all about? This is an important part of the story, though. Long before I made it up to Tallahassee in July of 1993, I spent a lot of time on the fourth floor of the Tampa Library. There were some great collections there. The first media relations person at USF was a guy named John Edgerton. John Edgerton came right out of school um, and in his early 20s was working with President John Allen as a public relations person. When John Edgerton witnessed what was going on here during the Johns Committee activities, he actually put together a typewritten manuscript called The Controversy. And it was amazing. What he did is he, he put together a tell-all from his perspective of what he witnessed firsthand had, that had happened here at USF during the USF investigations. At this time, USF had no alumni. It was a much smaller school. There were, there were fewer than 2,000 in the charter class. There were fewer than 5,000 in the early 1960s. This was a tiny school. Had no alumni to defend it in the legislature. Well, yeah, when the Johns Committee arrived, the, John, the charter class hadn't even graduated yet, that's right? That's exactly right. I mean, that's a really good point. The, John, the Johns Committee was here before the first graduates of USF occurred. Right. And there were some people who I would argue, some members of the committee, who really didn't like USF, and I'll try to get back to that a little later on. The thing to remember, though, is John Edgerton had his record. Steve Lawson had met a white librarian from Miami Beach named Ruth Perry. And years later, Ruth Perry's collection, a very small collection of stuff about her experiences as a white member of the NAACP in Miami-Dade County, also found their way here to USF Tampa. So I had a lot of good stuff here to work with. Like I like to say, even before the records opened up in July of 1993, the foundation was already in place because of what I had to work with at the USF Tampa Library. More so than at Gainesville at PK Young, more so than at FSU Strozier. This was where to go, which is another important point I want to get to in just a second. Um, I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. The records opened up in July of 1993, and that afternoon, after I had dug into the records, I had a prearranged call all ready to go to WUSF Radio. And so I was reporting as a kind of graduate student slash journalist from Tallahassee on the day the records opened as a follow-up to my earlier conversation on the radio. Mm 
so that I was giving a blow-by-blow -blow account of what I found on my first day digging into the Johns Committee, so that folks listening to NPR in the Tampa Bay area knew that I was doing my job, I guess. Right. I, spent the rep, I spent about four and a half weeks or five weeks up there, something like that. Um, and I came back a couple times thereafter, and I got through about half the collection in, in the first visit. Um, by the time I was ready to start writing it, almost 2,800 note cards. Right. This is before online. It was a little bit different. But coming back to USF, this is another very important story. The battle to get these records open is largely the battle that goes in three waves. Or two, three waves in terms of the history of the Johns Committee, but two waves in terms of uh, the battle. The first battle was the unsuccessful battle to get the records open, and that was what Steve Lawson and what Bonnie Stark did in the 1980s. The second battle, which is where I start to get involved, was the battle that the records did get open. Again, not just because of me, but because of a lot of good people. But here's the most important thing, and here's something that is really strong for the historical record. The first wave of John's Committee scholarship, pre-opening of the records and opening of the records, is all primarily USF people. Myself, Steve Lawson, Bonnie Stark, and also a USF graduate who did her master's here, but actually did her doctoral dissertation at UNC Chapel Hill, and her focus on the Johns Committee took place at that point. Her name was Stacy Brockman. So Stacy Brockman, although she didn't really focus on the Johns Committee while here, when she went on to do her doctoral dissertation, the time she had as a, you know, with mentors like Steve Lawson and Nancy Hewitt allowed her to have a good understanding of why the Johns Committee was important. I think that sometimes get lost, gets lost, and I think that 20 or 30 or 40 years from now as we talk, try to contextualize what the Johns Committee was and why it was significant, I think it's very important to remember that the instigators of getting these records open, the scholarly instigators, were all University of South Florida people. They weren't Gators and they weren't Seminoles, right. they were USF Bulls, and we were pretty aggressive about that. Why do you think that is? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the cohort of faculty that we had here at the history right. department. We had some really strong faculty in various areas. Again, Steve Lawson had been involved with Eyes on the Prize. Nancy Hewitt was one of the most renowned scholars of uh, women's and women and gender history. Gary Mormino was a consummate historian of Florida. I would even throw Nick Wynn, who was at that time the executive director of the Florida Historical Society. Um, he, through his organization and the, the organization itself, lent a lot of support to the idea of getting these records open to clear the air. So there was a lot of good things, there were a lot of great things happening at that time and a lot of them were centered here on the Tampa campus of USF. Um, 1993, I'm working on my master's research, I come back again in 1994. By that time they moved the records over to the archives. I think the thing to know is that the, during my first visit they were working, we worked out of the Senate office building, so they weren't even in archives yet. Interestingly enough, Bonnie Stark was there for part of that time. She was going to rework her thesis into a book. That never happened. Um, but what happened is between 93 and 95, I began the process of writing. And it was, a, it was a, quite a challenge because what I didn't want to do was focus upon the committee as, uh, in terms of the small pieces. Right. There were the civil rights investigations. There's a larger Cold War theme. There's the anti-communism theme. There's, of course, the attacks against GLBTQ people. Um, again, lesbian investigations were largely not in the earlier records, or if they were, they were more or less sanitized because newspapers of the early 1960s really didn't deal with gay and lesbian issues in any substantive way. So the older narratives tended to focus more on civil rights issues. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do was something that was, I think, trying to bite off a lot more than anyone should have tried to chew, and do an overall institutional history of the Johns Committee. Right. And 341 pages later, somehow it all came together. But it was amazing because when I started to dig deeper into the research, I started to see all these relationships between people who had largely been exonerated from their activities on the committee right. as time had gone by. And I guess probably the greatest example is my local congressman, U.S. Representative Bill Young, who for years <clears throat> had talked about you know, development and, and ironically had become quite a good friend of USF when he was a young, ambitious state senator in the early 1960s. He was involved with the Johns Committee, not during this entire tenure, but during the latter part of it. But what's important to know is he was involved with the Johns Committee at a point in 1963 when John Allen, the president of USF, was called to defend the, quote, intellectual trash and the other questions about the way he managed USF. John Allen, in my mind, comes out as a true hero because Allen had 
a lot of work to do on his hands to save USF. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Bill Young's kind of funny in the sense that when he was interviewed in 1993 after the records opened, Bill Young's perspective was, oh, that was a long time ago, I don't remember anything. When he was asked about if, his, if he was involved with the Purple Pamphlet, the 1964 document, Homosexuality and Citizenship in Florida, which again, five years before Stonewall puts Florida on the national stage of GLBT awareness, not the positive way. Um, the irony, of course, is that you know Bill Young claimed he had no knowledge of it, but his name was right there on the label, on the author's title page. So Bill Young fully knew what he was doing back then. And of course, after Bill Young's death, there were some other questions about what a family man he was that I think future historians will have a good time with. But back to John Allen. One of the challenges that John Allen faced as president was during the investigations that began in 62 primarily and kicked up into 63, they focused a lot on academic freedom here. You had um, a guy named Thomas Wenner who was an instructor in the course called The American Idea, which was an undergraduate core course, um, who had been involved with some local people who had questions about what the university was. You had a situation where you had a lot of first time in college. USF was given that name in large measure because when the Board of Control, the predecessor to the Board of Governors, created the fourth public university in Florida, they probably thought that in the 1950s, and USF's name came a little later than what was established, that this would be the last university they would need. This should never have been called USF, it should have been called UCF, we're in Central Florida, or something like that. Anyways, when USF was, was established, it was established in a way that a lot of people didn't like it. People in the Tampa Bay community, some people didn't like its location. They wanted it to be downtown. There was actually talk briefly about taking over UT, the University of Tampa. That would have been a parking nightmare. But when USF Tampa was established, some people were mad because it was way out in the boonies in, tar in, in, in Temple Terrace. And again, back then, Temple Terrace was way out in the boonies in, re in perspective. Others didn't like it because, because it didn't have a football team. They wanted to have a football team to compete against UT, which did have a football team. So you had people who didn't like USF because it didn't have football. You had a lot of first time in college, meaning a lot of parents who had never attended college themselves. What, why is that important? Well, at, this is a time when people were still of the mindset, largely, that people who were college-age students, who were adults, oftentimes, were considered, quote, children. We still had a dean of men and a dean of women here at USF right. in the early years. And so the concern was that the children, some of whom were in their mid-twenties, might be exposed to ideas that children weren't quite ready for. And so it's a really cool uh, analogy that what USF was doing in its early years, there were no professional schools, there was no college of nursing, no college of medicine, the professional schools didn't really exist. It was like a big liberal arts college on the Tampa campus. USF was pushing the envelope with all these young, enthusiastic faculty who had come here. They wanted to help reshape this area by creating a high quality of education. USF's hallmark at that time and forward is that. So you have these faculty, like one whose name is beloved to me, Charlie Arnotti. Charlie Arnotti grew up um, all over the world. He was a globetrotter. He taught in history and in political science and government and international affairs here at USF. He was one of the earliest faculty hires here. He had finished his degree at University of Florida. At that time, he was um, contacted by the Johns Committee because he was a member of the NAACP and very involved in pro-civil rights activities. He was again contacted by the Johns Committee while he was an instructor at FSU. And then when he came to USF, he got call he called, called before the committee again. So he was brought before the committee on three different occasions while at three different institutions. But Charlie Arnotti was one of those types of individuals that the committee scorned. Because here you have a person who had no problem with cultural diversity at a time when that was considered a bad phrase, who encouraged his students to think outside of the box, who challenged his students to deal with ideas that are not in their natural comfort zones. And you have a number of people like that. I had a number of opportunities to interview folks who are no longer with us. One of them is Phyllis Marshall who was an early leader of student affairs and later the Marshall Center was named in her honor because of her leadership of cultivating students. Her memories were just of how this time during the USF investigations really caused a chill on our campus here, the way that the ones that UF and FSU had done on those campuses. Um, when I talked with Charlie Arnotti, one of the things that came out of his conversations and his memories quite strongly was how much he was upset with President John Allen and wanted John Allen to do more.
and had a number of times where he had been somewhat confrontational with John Allen. Again, it's hard to go back and, and talk about this without putting it within the, a different framework. What I don't think Charlie understood at that moment in time in the early years was, had John Allen taken the higher road in terms of becoming more forceful about um, questioning the motives of these lawmakers, these lawmakers would have replaced him with a lackey. In, in some ways, USF was beneficial that John Allen was our first president. John Allen had previously been the vice president at the University of Florida. After a presidential departure, he became the acting president for a brief period of time at UF. Why is that important? He knew the lay of the land. If they had brought in an outsider, um, you know, some big brain from out of the state, and that's, I think, what happened when Gordon Blackwell came from Tata Shu, um, you would have had a different environment, but they would have gotten rid of him and replaced him with a more favorable and friendly president. So while John Allen didn't take a stand in the way that some faculty like Charlie or not he wanted to, he did take a stand. Right. Case in point, in the summer of 1962, while John Allen was out of the area on summer vacation, USF summer sessions were much emptier back then, right. you only had a few thousand people, <clears throat> the Johns Committee had been quietly conducting the, some of its interviews and, and research here uh, without alerting the university, and that's what they did at Florida and at Florida State. They liked the shock factor. They wanted to create something that would scare the bejesus out of those who were supportive of the committee. So in the summer of 62, they used the Tampa Times, which was the afternoon Tampa newspaper. It was more conservative than the Tribune, and they published in there an extended investigation, expose of what's going on at USF. Your children are learning that evolution exists. They're in courses with professors who use words like damn and hell. Right. And your children are being exposed to pornographic literature, uh, books in anthropology that include pictures of naked animals, <laughs> stuff like that. Anyways, <clears throat> what you see happening as a result of this is John Allen's not around to defend the institution, but... Well, and this is the first he hears of the investigation, is that right? For the most part, he really right. knew that... He, I think that John Allen knew that the possibilities of, the investigate, of an investigation were real. Right. Why do I say that? Because USF became the first institution at the undergraduate level, the first public university, to admit an African-American student, the first historically white one, when Ernest Boger came. And it was about the same time. And that was a very careful cakewalk, too. That was a very careful diplomatic walk. They wanted to select an African-American student that was exemplary in all ways, and so that if he didn't, you know, so that it didn't look as if it was a, a, a bad choice. Right. So John Allen realized, I think, that something was going to come down the pipeline. But here's what John Allen did. He found out that many of the investigations and many of the interviews with students and others were being conducted at the Hawaiian Village, off of Dale Mabry, and other hotels far away from campus, a tactic that the Johns Committee had used quite successfully at Florida and Florida State and, and Florida A&M. For example, at University of Florida in 1957-58, when the Johns Committee first began to focus on homosexuality and gay and lesbian issues, um, along with academic freedom and integration, they published a 2,000-page document. 2,000 pages of the transcripts of the Johns Committee records are called, quote, Crimes Against Nature at the University of Florida. And again, it was a, a great titillating type of a, a narrative. John Allen knew about this. I mean, he knew what was happening at his, at his former employer. So John Allen was in the aware about that. So John Allen says, you guys want to have investigations? Fine and dandy. You are the lawmakers. It's within the purview of you, your body as the legislature to create interim investigation committees, even though you are the legislative branch, not the executive and judicial branches. You may act like them sometimes. But he had most of the interviews, as many as he could, or as many as he was aware of, they took place in the ADM building on campus with a USF employee also tape recording the, con the conduct of them to protect the students, to protect the faculty, and to protect the institution. Johns didn't like this at all. He thought John Allen should have been, you know, should stop meddling. And there were conversations of possibly trying to get John Allen removed. It never did happen. But the important thing for us to remember is that John Allen took a very courageous stand right. to defend USF at a time when USF had no alumni, no true friends in the legislature. And Sam Gibbons was a friend in the sense that he could, he could help out a little bit. Sam Gibbons would later refer to Charlie Johns and the Johns Committee as the Christopher Columbus of Homosexuality for their ability to uncover things. The investigations that the committee did were pretty bad too. Again, they would often target people that were easy targets. Um, 
One of the people that they targeted, um, many of the people they targeted at Florida and Florida State and the gay and lesbian witch hunts up there were people that they could use under the um, Crimes Against Nature law, which was a very fluid and, and expansive law. Un depending upon how that's interpreted, you could be married to your heterosexual opposite sex spouse, but if you were alleged to have committed a, a non-procreative sex act with that individual, right. you could be you could be condemned for a, quote, homosexual act on a member of the opposite sex. Um, school teachers, there, were a, there was a school teacher, I believe, at Boca Ciega High in Pinellas County who either lost her job or was threatened with losing her job because she had admitted, she was in her 20s, she was in a monogamous heterosexual relationship, that when she was a teenager, a 12-year-old girl, she had kissed another girl as a friend and therefore she had homosexual tendencies and was a threat to the classroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you read these documents over and over and it gets the prur you talk about prurient literature, the Johnson Committee created some, some early narrative pornography. Right. Um, you know, that's its, its legacy. And they kind of culminated with that purple pamphlet. Exactly, you know. I mean, the purple pamphlet was, was an outrageous document. The irony, of course, is that even though it was very homophobic, right. it, 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 puts a, it puts down on the table a lot of conversations. So now you knew what a queen really was because they had a descriptive glossary. You knew what certain numbers like 69 meant now. I mean, they actually helped to promote an awareness of sexual activity, right. their, own, their own contorted way. Because what happened is the book was reprinted and published by bookstores outside of Florida. The attorney general for Miami-Dade County actually called it pornographic literature, which the Johnson Committee had to re rebut back. The irony, of course, too, is that the Johns Committee... Uh, was so overwhelmed with requests for the booklet that what they began to do, because it did have a few choicely created photos for dramatic effect, is they would just all of a sudden give mimeographed copies of words, which nobody really wanted to read those. Um, the other thing that, that's amazing about this whole time is that while the Johns Committee is doing its work, Florida is undergoing some incredible changes. Florida's demographics are changing. Florida is in the, this, this is a time when the battle between rural North Florida and the urbanizing Central and South Florida are taking place. Again, USF is front and center and the Tampa Bay region is front and center. These areas had been historically ignored. I mean, we have to go back to 1905, 50 years earlier than, or 60 years earlier than the Johns Committee's uh, disestablishment, and look at the fact that when the University of Florida moved from Lake City to Gainesville, people thought Gainesville was too far south. So Florida was mostly at that point what we would today consider old North Florida. So you have a largely white supremacist um, culture that goes back to the years of slavery, the antebellum period up in North Florida. You have a lot of segregationists in the Tampa Bay area and in South Florida as well, but you also have a lot of people who come to these areas that are more progressively minded. The Johns Committee had fellow travelers. You know, they were looking for fellow travelers among communist integrationists, and some of the fellow travelers that they have, their records are actually here at the USF Tampa Library. For example, they had a long-time district attorney in this area named Herbert S. Phillips. Herbert S. Phillips was an amazing character. He was in, uh, a man of the law, but he was also a man who had some pretty strong racial tendencies. And um, his collection here at USF Tampa Spec Call has a number of different things, which, again, he has a picture of then-Vice President Richard Nixon. At the time, Nixon was Vice President to Eisenhower in the 1950s in some sub-Saharan African country, I think it's Ghana, but don't quote me on that, where he's embracing or holding, you know, kind of congratulating Ghana or this new, this new country on breaking the chains of colonialism and becoming an independent nation. And his flyer makes the point that Richard Nixon is probably an integrationist loving communist. <laughs> um, Herbert Phillips' papers have a number of screeds that you have about don't let your white daughter talk to those black men because the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. There's even a, one of my favorite little things was a little single pam page pamphlet of a song that was created called Segregation, which is right. amazing. So you have the, one of the lead law enforcement officers, if you will, in the Tampa Bay area is a very proud white supremacist. At the same time, in another collection that's here over in this Tampa, USF Tampa Library, you have the son of the man who donated the land for Lowry Park Zoo, Sumter Lowry. Sumter Lowry was called Old 93, he was born in 1893, and until his death in the early 1970s was considered to be a local hero, a war hero in a lot of ways. Um, he was involved with the National Guard, um, and he was very much a big part of Tampa's social circles. Right. 
He also was an avowed white supremacist who ran for governor in 1956, I believe, on the Democratic t ticket as part, as part of the primary loss. But he ran on a very simple platform, keep white schools white. And whenever he'd ask him what he wanted to do, what are you going to do about e economic growth? I'll keep white schools white. What will you do about the citrus economy? I'll keep white schools white. He loses the election, of course, but the thing to know about Sumter Lowry is he also decides he needs to create a friends group to help the Johns Committee and also to help other causes that would keep those people on their side of the tracks. So he created a, there were a number of different white supremacist types of groups in the South. We all know about the Klan, which is not a single body but an amorphous group. You also have these groups throughout the South called the White Citizens Council, which were local groups that tried to perpetuate what we call sundown towns. You may let blacks come in during the day to do domestic work, but they get the hell out of there before the sun goes down. Sumter Lowry also created, um, using, you know, wrapping the flag around himself as a war hero, created an organization called the Florida Coalition of Patriotic Societies. So under his Florida Coalition, he saw this as a fellow traveler to help the Johns Committee weed out unholy activities in the Tampa Bay area. I mean, Sumter Lowry was very vicious about his belief in maintaining a certain worldview. When Tampa's mayor, Julian Lane, who was no progressive mind, he was a very, very traditional conservative mayor of Tampa. When Tampa's mayor, Julian Lane, was in power in the early 1960s, there were letters in the city of Tampa archives in which Sumter Lowry was writing to Julian Lane complaining that there should be more blue laws in effect. The only thing that should be open in the big city of Tampa on Sundays are churches, maybe a grocery store, the police fire in the hospital. Right. All these other laundromats can stay closed. This is a day of rest. And I mean, we had such laws in the 1890s, and you know they they had to start making exemptions for trains and every every other thing. So they finally just repealed most exactly. of it. Exactly. Well, and that, the irony is that at the point that Tampa starts to get on the cusp of being this great urban center <laughs> right. in the early 1960s, you know you have Sumter Lowry looking back to a, a different time and wanting to make Tampa the city of the human in the 1890s as a baby. You know, I think that there's a lot to say that what the Johns Committee was in the 1950s and 1960s was a last-ditch effort by those largely in North Florida, but not entirely in North Florida, who saw the writing on the wall. Civil rights became an inevitability, and especially after the, the Brown decision was one good mile marker. Right. Um, the Tallahassee bus boycott gets them created. The 1964 Civil Rights Act tried to change them in a different direction because now you have federal law which says you cannot discriminate. Right. And again, there are, some, there are some activities out in St. Augustine where the Johns Committee investigates what they consider the racial discord, which is largely the racial discord of whites pouring uratic acid into swimming pools, right. but they saw it really as Martin Luther King and all the troublemaking African Americans trying to you know, harm the white businesses by their presence. So you have all this going on. What I'm trying to say is that the Johns Committee was not was, was populated by people and was supported by people who wanted to turn back the hands of time and to turn back the tide to a different type of world. They wanted a world which white supremacy, where white supremacy was allowed, continued, celebrated, and they didn't want to move forward. You know, I, I think if you were to walk around the Tampa campus in 2015 and look at our student body, look at our faculty, look at the curricular offerings we have today, this, if you were to have a time machine and in 1962 or 1963, when the Johns Committee is conducting its investigations, if you could shove all the members of the Johns Committee and their wonderful investigator, Remus Strickland, into a box and then open the door to right in front of Cooper Hall or the Tampa Library today, what we today see as a vibrant, healthy, celebrated university with a great academic reputation, they would call hell on earth. You've got non-whites all over the place, and you have all this integration happening. You have people talking about ideas that were not considered to be within an acceptable sphere of influence. They would see hell in where we see heaven. Mm -hmm. And it, I, that's a really important irony. A couple of other examples of what happened in the Johns Committee investigations here at USF. There was um, an opportunity that the university had to hire a retiring Vanderbilt professor named mm -hmm. Dina Frank Fleming, D.F. Fleming, who's a very noted political scientist. He had written a book called The Cold War and Its Origins, and D.F. Fleming, um, in his book, makes a point that the Soviet Union, as well as the West, had some level of compl complicity, that it takes two to have a quarrel, not just one drama queen or one belligerent person and one innocent bystander who's pure. 
And again, his book was, was not panned, it was well regarded, and he was considered a, quite somewhat of an authority. Well, D.F. Fleming was offered a part-time opportunity to teach here at USF. Um, just before his contract was tendered, and at the time he had put a down payment on the house in the Tampa Bay area, the Johns Committee contacted John Allen and put John Allen in a very difficult position by ascribing communist affiliations to D.F. Fleming, saying, we got dirt on him. I can't tell you what it is, we got dirt on him, however. Well, John, John Allen, of course, had no choice but to rescind the contract. Later, it turns out that John's committee's um, attacks or, or information on D.F. Fleming were on somebody named D.J. Fleming. They couldn't get the initials right. right. So the John's committee used false information about an entirely different person as a way to keep USF from hiring this guy. That's what brought the American Association of University Professors here right. and why USF was censored. So, I mean, USF was censured early in its history. Right. USF, as a child, was already put in detention before it got to kindergarten. <laughs> I mean, it's a real shame. Well, you know, and also, I think you kind of pointed this out earlier, and that I think Edgerton does at some point, and some other people, that really the critics from the left weren't of any help. They, no. they were really, uh, like you said, if, if Allen had you know, followed their advice, he would have been gone. USF would have been a community college. End of story, probably, right? That's a good point. I mean, and you know, when we talk about Florida during that time and we talk about critics from the left, the critics right. from the left would be critics from the moderate center today. <laughs> well, right. Yeah, F Florida, putting the words Florida and progressive in the same sentence really didn't mean much unless you're talking about progressive termites and progressive citrus. I mean, there was a lot, this was a very reactionary town. Tampa was in many ways, a, a, a growing city that was trying to cling on to its old school aspirations. Right. You know, and, and it's evidence because even after the committee comes to an end in the late 60s, you have terrible riots here in Tampa. Right. So there are racial issues here that are, that are not fully addressed. Well, and one other thing I just uh, wanted to mention too, and I don't know how much this came across your radar screen, but you know, the, the fears of the Johns Committee were coming to life in 62. Like the USF students were already arguing for the integration of the university restaurant, which was off campus. Exactly. So, you know, that must have been like a warning, like, oh, this is already happening. I mean, these students are already being indoctrinated, right? You know, and I think that's a, you know, I, I've once heard of some people have some, I've heard people say that in the late 60s and early 70s, USF was in some ways, quote, the Berkeley of the South. <laughs> Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but there's a lot to be said for the fact that there was a restaurant that was built among the sand hills of what is now Fowler Avenue, about the time USF opened, called Scaglione's University Restaurant. And it was not part of USF, it was along the way, it was near where University Mall is today. But the thing is, just to talk about students wanting to integrate an off-site thing was considered to be an affront. You know, a lot of what you see happening is that there was a fear that the, quote, children at USF were being exposed to ideas that were unnatural, and they, that needs to be curtailed. One other major USF investigation involved a professor of English named Sheldon Grebstein who came here and the, he was involved in teaching a number of classes. He came from the University of Kentucky. One of the things he wanted to do in an advanced class, and this was a class in which the youngest student I believe was 24 years of age, these were not children, quote unquote, these were adults under the law at that time, was he was no fan of the Beats. He didn't like Jack Kerouac or Allen Ginsberg. Ginsburg. He did not like beat writers. But he wanted to use the writings of some of the beat writers like Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg to show how shallow, in his opinion, their writing was. Well, of course, by putting in front of those, quote, children, words like damn and hell, he was exposing them to words that they, their innocent ears may have never heard before. Well, Grebstein um, gets called before the committee investigated, and later, um, the, as, as a result of his use of such controversial literature, the Board of Control decides they're going to put together an academic freedom policy to govern what professors can use in class. Right, responsibilities associated yeah. with academic freedom. Exactly, and so what, what happens is Sheldon Grefstein leaves USF, right. which Sheldon does pretty well. He actually goes on and becomes a college president up in the SUNY system in New York. Um, and it's ironic, I was actually here on campus years ago when he came back to USF Tampa, USF for the first time in almost 25 or 30 years, probably 30 years, um, to give a talk about his memories of USF. And you know, the, here he comes back, and he hadn't been in the Tampa Bay area for three decades or so, and what the witness, the witness the changes he did, but again, he made the right decision by leaving. But there was a lot of challenges. For example, 
universities today are held to a lot of accountability measures. How many students do we graduate? What is our FTE? What is our enrollment? How many books do we have per student? All that stuff was all fine and dandy. But there's one thing you can't quantify. How many people heard about what was happening in Florida because of the Johns Committee and said, there's no way in hell I'm going to A, work here or go here as a student. Right. Um, that there's a, that the, and whether that means USF or FSU or UF or any other schools, the Johns Committee did a lot of damage to Florida's academic reputation. That would take years to, to correct. It's not really until the late 70s and early 1980s under governors like Askew and, and Graham that you really see Florida start to move forward. Higher education in Florida goes through a very ambitious upswing during the 1980s. But back to the 60s really quickly. After the Johns Committee came to an end, you begin to see new controversies hitting the institution. And one of my favorite is, for example, that after John Allen retires, um, the next president we have, Cecil Mackey, sometimes referred to as Mack the Knife, was very ambitious in expanding graduate programs. So the, the, committee, the committee's legacy goes away, but the battles that take place between students and the institution continue. Um, what you see, for example, is when WUSF radio originally began, there were a lot of student-focused programming, including they had a radio program called the Underground Railroad. They had a lot of rock music and things like that. One of the things Mackey's looking at in the early 1970s is he's expanding the graduate programs. He's putting together the professional schools of medicine, engineering, nursing, and he realizes that if he wants the demographic of the greater Tampa Bay area to support USF, we need to get all that crazy rock and roll off of WUSF radio and replace it with beautiful music. So again, the battles continue in different ways. At the same time that the GLBT battles continue. 1969 and Stonewall is often considered a very important mile marker of gay and lesbian history, wherein the Johns Committee was, more than a decade earlier, a very big part of GLBT history. Mm -hmm. Florida, the magnet of GLBT history comes back to Florida in the 1970s with Anita Bryant the former spokesperson for the Florida Citrus Commission, who later became very outspoken in her homophobic views of, of gays and lesbians during the 70s and was involved in attempts to repeal ordinances in Miami-Dade. So Florida's history is affected in many ways by this kind of tug of war between a couple of various schools of thought. Those who see Florida as a forward-moving progressive place, a land of opportunity where you can cast aside your old, your old dirty laundry and put on your bathing suit and swim in, you know, the land of milk and honey versus those who would like to keep Florida whistling Dixie. Right. And what the Johns Committee was, was in many ways an attempt to, to try to slow down, if not stop, that move forward. Well, and one of the other features, you know, you're talking about all these other things, is, you know, the constant intervention by the state government into education in the university system in very intimate ways, you know. And the Johns Committee wasn't the first time, it wasn't the last time. And we've got lots of mechanisms still that are designed, you know, to uh, to have right. direct control over over the education system, over a, peop a lot of people who, you know, um, may, may not be qualified to do so. You know, that's a good point because Florida was the last state east of the Mississippi River to consolidate and create a system of higher ed. There was a University of Florida prior to 1905, but it's not until 1905 under the Buckman Act that Florida truly has a system of universities. There were three original post-secondary institutions of higher learning. University of Florida in Gainesville moved from Lake City, Florida State College for Women, later Florida State University in Tallahassee, and the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical College for Negroes, which later became Florida a and University. So you have three institutions. USF becomes the fourth. The Board of Control was the board that oversaw higher ed in Florida under the Buckman Act. The name was so fitting. One of the things that right. happened as a result of the Johns Committee, however, was they decided to create a bit of a political buffer and create a situation where the Board of Control would be replaced by what they then called the Board of Regents and give a little bit more space between universities and lawmakers. Of course, the irony is that in the last 10 or 15 years, we've kind of stepped back in terms of our way of governance where the Board of Regents, after there was a, there was a local lawmaker who was an FSU alum who wanted a college of chiropractic at FSU. And when that didn't happen, he got a little bit mad. And there were some other local lawmakers who wanted things to happen. And when the Board of Regents said, we're not properly funded to do what we're doing, we can't take on more of your pet projects, one of the responses was to disestablish the Board of Regents, create what we now have the university, the, the, the State Board of Governors, the State Board. Right. And now you have the Boards of Trustees that are largely people that are local business leaders, but not with as much general public representation. 
um, and we've kind of moved forward um, in not always the most progressive way. I often say that politics and education are intimately related, and USF is probably the greatest example of that in the state of Florida, not in a positive way. USF has been a fighter and a survivor. USF during the Johns Committee years survived the Johns Committee. Accidental image prevailed. No, it's accidental learning prevailed over accidental image, excuse me. But here's what else to know. As USF grew during the 60s and 70s, USF had the largest service area of any state university. From Brooksville, where Chinsegat Hill was, all the way down to the tip of the Everglades, USF had campuses in originally Tampa, St. Petersburg in 65, and in the early 70s, Fort Myers, which became our third major campus, then Sarasota, as we took possession of New College, a private institution, and then Lakeland. I think it's ironic that in the past 20 years or so, um, since the early 1990s, USF has been the fall guy, if you will, right. for expansion of higher ed. <laughs> USF was, by many accounts, the biggest institution with service area in the state. In the early 90s, the Fort Myers campus was closed, was transitioned as Florida Gulf Coast University was created. Gulf Coast offered classes, I think, in 97, USF Fort Myers closed. Um, in the late 1990s, there was a lawmaker from Manatee County who was whining about not having his own college campus. So the lawmakers, as a going away president, decided to sever the new college, the State Honors College of USF, so ably governed forever, and create New College of Florida. Right. So if you go to what is now USF Sarasota Manatee, it's actually a campus physically disassociated, if I some distance, from what used to be USF Sarasota and New College. And while New College is independent, the relationship is still very strong down there. And of course, recently, the um, actions of a lawmaker in Polk County <laughs> right. who took what was called USF Lakeland, it started in the 1980s, later called USF Polytechnic. Why you need a polytechnic in the middle of an orange grove is a good question to create what became Florida Polytechnic University. And the argument that was made and was supported by Governor Rick Scott and the legislature and others in trying to assuage certain lawmakers was Florida needed a polytechnic university, which really shows that lawmakers and others have short memories. Right. There was a law, there was an institution created in the 1960s, which was the state's first polytechnic university that nobody talks about. It was FTU, right. Florida Technological University was created in the Orlando area as the state's high-tech engineering school. We don't call it FTU anymore, we call it UCF. Right. So the irony is that they've created something that they already had 50 years earlier. Right. And I guess the big question is, when Florida Polytechnic starts wanting to offer degrees in literature and history, does it lose the technical, the polytech name or not? Right. So Florida, again, USF's history is so closely tied to the growth of Florida after World War II USF played a huge role through the students and faculty here right. in addressing a very bad chapter. Well, and with the, the expansion and everything, it's like a series of shotgun weddings and exactly. like sudden divorces. You know? yeah. And uh, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, I guess, I guess in a kind of a closing remark, at the end of the day, USF still flourishes. Right. Even though USF, by force of the legislature, the St. Petersburg campus had to become a separately accredited entity to appease lawmakers, even though Sarasota had to follow the same path. And there were benefits to that, but also there are good and bad opportunities as a result. At the end of the day, you know, more than 50 years after its inception, nearly 60 years after its creation, USF is doing quite fine. And right. I think that's a testament to the institution. It's also a testament to how the libraries here preserve the good records of what happened. Well, um, I want to thank you for, for taking the time with us today. Um, and uh, so much information in less than one hour. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right.